you are welcome to yet another episode of LFN What's Your Say? The leading listening show where we discuss important issues with important people like you. We are still featuring R. Kelly. Real name Robert Sylvester Kelly. Also known as the R&B King. Today we are again diving deep into one of the most polarizing legal situations in recent history. One that saw R. Kelly wrongfully convicted and sentenced to an overly long prison term of 30 years, a sentence that even some murderers don't get. Over the years, the R&B singer has faced numerous legal battles, and despite some cases being dismissed or charges dropped, he remains incarcerated. Many in fact wish to know exactly why R. Kelly is still in prison yet all his legal arguments presented in high defense in both the New York and Chicago cases make a lot of sense. Why would the justice system fail to deliver a fair trial, or is the matter a lot more complex than we think? Let's unpack the details. This specific episode seeks to explore the legal aspects of R. Kelly's situation, and not to excuse anybody whether in the defense or prosecution camps that may have committed any crimes. We are aiming for a factual discussions and not to simply sway opinions, and to illuminate the judicial nuances behind his case. We all know by now that R. Kelly's legal issues which span decades from the 90s involved allegations of sexual misconduct, abuse and exploitation. Let's briefly summarize the two major cases both in Chicago and the one in New York. In the Chicago trial, R. Kelly faced multiple charges but many were clearly dismissible due to the statute of limitations which the judge unfortunately refused to apply. For those unfamiliar with statutes of limitations, these set time limits within which legal proceedings must be initiated. After this time, prosecution is no longer viable not necessarily because the allegations lack merit, but because the law priorities timely prosecution to ensure fairness in trials. Our argument today is that these statutes of limitations that existed at the time R. Kelly is alleged to have committed crimes should have protected him from any form of litigation as they had duly expired. The existent statute of limitations then indicated that the said victims of such allegations may litigate before they pass the age of 25. By 2019 however when all this started, these had duly expired and R. Kelly needed not appear in court to defend against any such charges as we saw the government impose. So why do statutes of limitations matter so much in cases like these? On one hand it prevents the prosecution of cases where evidence may have degraded over time. Witnesses do forget details over time, physical evidence is lost and it becomes harder to ensure a fair trial for the defendant. In R. Kelly's Chicago case, the dismissal of charges under the statute of limitations does not equate to a declaration of innocence. Instead, it means the court could not legally pursue those charges. It also raises questions about why these cases weren't brought to trial sooner if the allegations were credible. And if they were brought sooner and acquitted, the court should not go against its own decision from history. Now, let's turn to the New York case. R. Kelly was convicted of racketeering and violating the Mann Act. The racketeering charge was particularly controversial because racketeering is typically associated with organized crime like mafia activities. There has to be a clear hierarchy of individuals who are working together with a common purpose to commit crime in order to prove a RICO enterprise. Critics of the case argue that prosecutors applied this charge in a novel way, claiming that R. Kelly's relationships and entourage constituted a criminal enterprise which is not necessarily true. A mere existence of a team of individual whose common purpose is not to commit crime as in the mafias and cartels does not justify the application of the RICO Act. If ever there existed an enterprise, it was not a criminal one as R. Kelly's management group was dedicated to managing his music career and nothing else. To a large extent the prosecution attempted to twist the usual business activities of R. Kelly's management team and use them to claim an illegal enterprise but they failed miserably because the operations referred to were not illegal at all. These were activities such as booking travel tickets for R. Kelly's entourage whenever he went on tour, and packing high bags, acts that are usual and normal in the busy lives of celebrities. The government generally failed to pin down R. Kelly as guilty of RICO Act violation, but nevertheless R. Kelly was charged and convicted for the same in error. It is in fact matters like these that are likely causing a delayed release of the New York appeal verdicts. Anything that brings hope that R. Kelly will regain his freedom has got to be delayed and tampered with. 
The Mann Act charges faced similar criticism. Originally enacted to combat human trafficking, the Mann Act has a history of being misused particularly in cases involving high-profile black individuals. The government started misusing the Mann Act as early as 1912, only two years after its enactment by James Mann who drafted the bill to Congress and using this law, the first black heavyweight boxing champion was prejudiced and forced into exile. President Donald Trump in fact had to swallow his pride and confess that the charges against Jack Johnson were vague and motivated by racism, when he made the decision to pardon the boxing champion posthumous. In R. Kelly's case, the argument is that the law was applied to situations that may not fit its original intent, leading us to question whether he was targeted unfairly. For the Mann Act to apply, the purpose of interstate commerce or call it transportation should be to commit crime in the destination state, but the purposes stated by all witnesses and the defense suggest the women traveled for other reasons such as to attend social events like the Oscars, and music shows while R. Kelly was on tour. None of these two are criminal purposes and this disqualifies the Mann Act charges. These legal nuances are critical because they highlight potential flaws in how justice is pursued, especially in high-profile cases where public opinion often sways the narrative. Without the RICO and Mann Act charges as per the New York case, we are only left with allegations of forced labor which are clearly misallocated. With the two cases disqualified like this, we see no reason why R. Kelly is still languishing in a maximum security prison yet he could have been busy with his music productions as the free man he deserves to be. If R. Kelly is going to be imprisoned, let it be for the right charges and not the fictitious RICO, Man Act and forced labor for the New York case, and also not for the Chicago counts whose litigation period had already expired. Clearly R. Kelly won both the Chicago and New York cases even though the system has preferred to keep him locked up in prison. If you wish to take part in a live interview discussing any of these topics, let us know by sending an email to sashalfnmedia at gmail.com for scheduling. Thank you for watching today's video, a production of LFN Media, giving you another perspective of issues at hand. We make it our business to keep you updated with the truth amidst the cloud of lies the media wants you to believe. It is therefore important to subscribe to this channel, hit the bell icon and allow all notifications so that you don't miss out whenever we publish a new video.